So this morning, uh, I was, um, this morning I'd like to talk about, um, it's sort of tied into our Sabbath school lesson about service, you know, we want to be able to serve God and live a life with purpose and meaning. I've been learning in the past few weeks that part of that is actually, it's really important at the foundation of our service to God is to have the right mindset. And uh, so I'd like to share some verses and some things I've learned to encourage you. Um, I, I understand that we're all in different places. And so I just pray that the Holy Spirit would be here to instruct and to guide and encourage us um, to be able to find our way in the service of God. But I'd like to share some lessons that I've learned in uh, the past couple of weeks. All right, a little little bit of review. By the way, could someone please give me the time? Is that okay? 11.35. 11.35, wonderful. Okay, plenty of time. Um, we're living in the midst of a crisis. Would everyone agree? As we look at the news today, you know, violence on every every side, isn't it? Um, not only that, we see the international tensions uh, just always on edge, aren't they? There's always someone saying, we're, we're scared there's a war going to break out, you know, unless something happens, unless someone humbles himself and uh, is willing just to go with the flow. You know, the nations are going to, the nations are angry, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That's what the Bible says. The UN reported, I think at least two weeks ago, that they were seeing natural disasters, significant, expensive natural disasters occurring at a rate of at least one a week, which they noted was much more than what they expected. When you look at the condition of the church today, not only our church, but God's people at large in the world today, there's confusion all around. Not only that, it's going out into the nations, you know, there's moral apostasy and moral confusion in the world and we know from history that whenever that sort of thing happens ruin has to follow so all of these things are adding up and we look when you look at matthew chapter 24 well what's the first sign that christ gives does anyone actually know that one that's a little little tricky one false christ thank you very much so false christ and deception right what's the next one that follows after that Wars and rumors of wars. Thank you. Okay, yes, we have uh, someone who's trust nobody, right? You know, go back to the source. <laughs> okay, so after wars and rumors of wars, what else do we have? Famines, natural disasters, and then again, false Christ, false prophets. So you've got false Christ, false prophets, then you've got nat- uh, international tension, environmental disasters, false Christ, false prophets. But then we also have something else happening. There's persecution within the church, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Following that, we see the love of many growing cold because of the false Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Truth and love are so closely linked. And when we, when people consciously make the decision to choose error instead of truth, the love of God and the love of truth grows cold. Mm-hmm. The love of, you know, love for people grows cold as well. But I praise God that in the midst of all of that, God has a people doing something. What are they doing? Spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel. So that when all have a chance, the end will come. So we're in the midst of a crisis. And as we look back in in, in history, did God ever give his people a message and instructions to follow to preserve life and his truth in the midst of crises? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about Noah. God told Noah to build an ark in order to save life. Now, he didn't just tell him, you know, build a boat. He gave him specific, clear instructions that were good to follow. Up until recently, I used to read those passages of the Bible and think, man, how boring. You know, the dimensions of an ark. I mean, come on. But when you put yourself in Noah's shoes, the dimensions of the ark (laughs) is very important. (laughs) Because, I mean, him and his family are going to be entering inside that ark. And through that, they will survive the crisis. So the details are important. Moses, let's go to Moses, uh, Exodus chapter 25, and we're going to read verse 40. And make these words our own. The lessons, the things that are written in the scriptures are written for our our learning, you know, so that we can gain our hope and comfort through them. So Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40. Okay, so God is giving the children of Israel and Moses instructions to build the sanctuary. And this is 
a reminder that God gives Moses while he goes through that process. It says, And look that thou make them, that is the items of the sanctuary, after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. So as Moses went about the task of building the interesting items in the sanctuary, full of instruction that were there to teach the people about the way of salvation, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, with the angels and everything, he was always to be mindful of what was revealed to him in the mountain. Has God revealed instructions to us? That as we go through life, as we progress through different areas and phases of our life, we can go back to that phase. We, we, sorry, we can go back to that pattern and think, all right, Lord, how can I go through this? Well, yes, he absolutely has. And so this morning, we want to be able to regain confidence, revive that confidence that we should have as God's people in his word and what he expects of us. So there are many ways that people speak about of, um, you know, ascertaining the will of God. I remember being in a prayer meeting um, down in, in sort of south of Brisbane, south side of Brisbane, and uh, I was really quite shocked at what I saw. We were in the church there, and it was a youth prayer meeting. And I'd, I'd heard a lot of, um, I've been through a lot of sermons and um, at least one seminar about contemplative prayer and the dangers of it. So I'm sitting in this prayer meeting, and uh, they pull out a, a Bible verse. There's some loose, loose practical applications of what we can do. And so already, you know, I'm just like, man, this is, you know, <laughs> there's, no, there's no foundation here. But then comes prayer time. And you know, usually we all gather together and we pray together. We actually talk to God about things. But they said, what we want you to do tonight is you want to go separate, one on, you know, just by yourself. Say a little prayer, but take the time to think and, you know, listen for the voice of God, right? Well, that's okay. That's good. But you can always tell a tree by its fruits. Mm -hmm. So when they come back and they start to share what God was sharing with them, you know, someone had this vision. Yeah, I saw this vision of like a brain and, and electricity and fire. And then a voice, but they get this. And then a voice said, this is only the beginning. And I was thinking, man, what voice was that? So there are many ways that people think that they can come to the will of God. But us for, as for us, I, I believe we don't do those things. But, you know, sometimes our feelings and our impressions and impulses can be quite strong. But those aren't bad in and of themselves, and we should pay attention to them. However, we must always consult the pattern that has been shown us in the mount. And I praise God for that. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. So we know that there is a pattern that God has given us, a divine pattern to follow as we serve him. And we want to just... Revive that confidence in how we can be certain about what we're doing for God. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And this is what the scripture says. Paul is writing to somebody who is going to take his place so that when he goes to the grave, the mission of the church will continue strong. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul counsels this young man. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My friends, if we want to do a work that is acceptable to God, we need to study the word of God and understand how to apply it to our lives. Amen. Isn't that something? Amen. That's the education that we need to be receiving on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, are we, are we just to read the word of God? No, my friends. We have to study the word. So, God has been teaching me that there's a difference between reading and there's a difference between studying. Mm -hmm. If I read, I, you know, it's what we just did here. But to really study is to take the time and think and reflect on what we just read. That's where our mind gains discipline. That's where we can store information in a place where we can um, quickly bring it out when someone asks us, asks us a question. Because we can sit through how many Daniel and Revelation seminars, how many uh, you know health workshops, but unless we actually take the time to store that in our mind in a place that we can easily recall it, we won't actually be able to give it to people in a way that's you know logical, makes sense, and is practical, and that's trustworthy. So there's an importance of study if we want to be able to show ourselves to God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. Is that all right? 
So that's the first step. If we want to know the will of God, praise God, He's given it to us so that we can study. Okay. Well, in order for us to be effective workmen for God, Paul also gives us some more, some other counsels that we should uh, give attention to. So there are certain areas in our life that is very important. Um, I'd like to just uh, paraphrase a quote from Help in Daily Living, which says, um, what a man is has far more influence than what he says. Amen? Amen. There is also, um, just the next paragraph down actually says, it is our experience, and our, a character and experience that determines our influence over other people. Mm. So if we're going through life and we're trying to speak for the Lord, and it just seems like people have no respect for what we're saying, Maybe we need to reflect on our experience and our character. So that's somewhere we can go, somewhere we can check. All right, so let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. And we're speaking about, you know, how we can influence people for the Lord. We want to be able to lead people into life everlasting. And so here are some simple things for us individually to consider. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. So the apostle says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul, as a preacher of the gospel, he understood the importance of actually self-control over his body. Yes, that applies to temperance and what we eat, etc. But that's not all because the body is more than just eating, right? Mm. When, when we are at work, when we are in, at the, you know, in school, wherever we are, self-control is such an important thing. Self-control, I'd like to explain it like this. It's the ability to always think about what you're doing. Yeah, when you're at work, remember that the tasks that the boss is giving you requires thought to do it well. Think about it. Tell yourself, I'm going to do this so well that Christ will be revealed. That Christian work ethic will be seen in what I do. So that when you come to the opportunity to talk, he actually has a respect for what you're saying. <laughs> you know, if we skip that part, we're, we're falling apart. So Paul made it his goal to control himself. Otherwise, when he preached, you know, it, he'll just be a castaway. So how did Paul find the strength for self-control? Let's go to Romans chapter 12, and verse, uh, verse 1. Strength for self-control. <clears throat> so it says that, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. There's something there to that, those lines, that, that line, by the mercies of God. Mm. The ability to think clearly, the ability to have hope and determination is firmly linked with a positive state of mind. So Paul, as he was seeking to present his body a living sacrifice to God, he always kept his mind on the mercy of God so that when he made mistakes, well, he didn't beat himself up. A lot of people are uh, struggling with addictions because of guilt and remorse. But Paul found the answer in trusting in the mercy of God, believing it for himself. That kept him positive. And when we trust the mercy of God, we understand that the, the ideal that he holds up for us is actually for our blessing. It's not just a matter of self-denial, but it's a matter of helping us in this life. So by looking to God's mercies, we find comfort, we find peace, and the ability to, yeah, you know, I actually want to, we find satisfaction of soul. Um, okay, the next question is, so the world is looking at our example that we are setting and the way we, we live our lives. So what should our relationship to the world be? We're in this world, but not of the world. Drop your eyes down to verse 2. And it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed in the renewing, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So we're in a world that, has, that does and says many things and plans many things. According to customs, you know, things that are um, that they think are good. 
many times, unfortunately, that just um, ministers to the senses of the people rather than what is really for their eternal good and what is really for their best. So we, we should always remember that while we're in this world, we should not be conformed and rolled over by the customs of this world. So prepare yourself for that. Mentally brace yourself through, through prayer you know, and, and meditation. That's an important thing. So we have a, a wonderful example in the life of Daniel, just to sum up this part. Daniel was placed in Babylon to witness to, to um, people in high places, people who are thinking men and women. And whenever they called on him to answer a question or answer a riddle or explain something to them, they always, you find, you'll find that they always said something, something along the lines of, can you explain this to me, Daniel? For I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, mm-hmm. right? How did they know that? <laughs> Aren't there fruits of the Spirit that testify to that? Or like Darius, when he was about to throw Daniel in the lion's den, he said, Daniel, I know that the God whom you serve continually will deliver you from the lion's mouth. So even though this man, you know, wasn't fully committed to God, he had confidence in the God of Daniel because the life that Daniel lived. There was something in his life that was like, maybe there is a God that is at work in this man's life. And you know, my friends... That's an ideal that God holds up to every single one of you today. He wants to be inside our hearts so that as we live our lives, as we speak to the people, they will see maybe there is a God that is worth following. Mm. So we praise God for these wonderful examples of Scripture. Now, Daniel was not just temperate and wise and, you know, illustrious and everything. He was dearly beloved of God. And God revealed that to him by the, his angel, his very own angel. Is it important for us to be fully convinced of God's love for us? Do you think it is? Oh, yes, absolutely it is. Let's go to First John chapter 4. Now, this is um, one of my favorite verses. It's just such a firm anchor. First John chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. Okay, so the Bible says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. John, the evangelist, was, if you remember, cast your mind back to chapter 1. He was simply writing about the things that he himself had experienced. And so we come to First John chapter 4, and he says... At the end of all these things, what I'm trying to explain is that I know God loves us and I believe it with all my heart. And so I can have judge- I can have confidence in the day of judgment. So can you. You know, unless we have that, we're, our words are really meaningless to people. You know, because some people, when, when we talk about God, some people have a negative picture of God. Yes. And so if all you do is talk about God without his love, to them you're just talking about an angry man in the sky. You know? We, we really need to, this is, the, this is the importance of thoughtfulness when we work for the Lord. We need to touch all these bases so that when we mention God, they're convinced, yeah, maybe God does love me. Yeah. So it's important for us to know and to believe the love of God. Now, I just want to recap. We've gone from self-control, thoughtfulness of how we treat our body, how we present ourselves in the workplace. So that people can see that the the spirit of the living God is in us. They can see that the God whom we continually serve will deliver us in times of trouble. But we also see here now that we need to know and believe the love of God. So this is where the discipline of mind comes in. To be able to uh, journey through the scripture, to be able to go through life with God and store in our minds useful experiences that God has given us. You know, this is where we talk about testimonies. We're able to store in our mind a testimony or experience that someone that we can help someone else with. And that will really, really help us in our, in our ministry. So I'd like to encourage us all with um, two verses from Proverbs and also um, two quotes from Ministry of Healing. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 31. So this is Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 31. And also verse 32. 
It's a wonderful verse. So the Bible says, uh, I'll let everyone turn there actually. These, these are wonderful words. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom. Not just words, my friends. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh frowardness. You know what frowardness is? Backwardness. It's sending people backwards. When we talk to people about God, we need to understand that sometimes we can say things that are, yes, true, and straight to the point, but they actually turn people away from God. So we need, we need to be wise. Uh, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 31. And this is our promise. Please cling to this this morning. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. It means repaid for all his work. Much more. Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm actually meant to be reading uh, Proverbs 11:30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. My friends, Amen. as we take the steps to educate ourselves in the service of God, which is simply morning devotion and thinking about what you read that morning <laughs> and not forgetting it, right? And taking it with you throughout the day and experiencing God, storing those, those experiences in your mind. When we take the step to educate ourselves to serve the Lord, to be wise in what we do, the Bible says that we will win souls, because he who wins souls is wise. That means if we want to win souls, we need to first be wise, you know. Let's not just go out there and preach, judgment is coming, you know, and, and wave your arms about. No, 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 no. God wants us to be uh, men of understanding, men and women of understanding. So there's a quote here from Ministry of Healing. Um, I have this little book. It's not the correct page numbering, but I believe in this one it's page 55. Um, yes, it says this. Let all cultivate their physical and mental powers to the utmost of their ability. This is encouragement for us this morning. That they may work for God where his providence shall call them. The same grace that, uh, that came from Christ to Paul and Apollos that distinguished them for spiritual excellencies will today be imparted to devoted Christian missionaries. Mm -hmm. God desires his children to have intelligence and knowledge that, were, that with unmistakable clearness and power, his glory may be revealed in our world. God is a God of glory and order and wisdom. And so when his children speak without thinking, yeah, it doesn't really glorify God at all. Um, so here, those are some words of encouragement in the right direction. But what can we say to those we know? How, wh where can we start? Things to think about. Here again in Ministry of Healing, it says, We should feel it our special duty to work for those living in our neighborhood. Study how you can best help those who take no interest in religious things. As you visit your friends and neighbors, show an interest in their spiritual as well as their temporal welfare. Speak to them of Christ as, as a sin-pardoning Savior. Invite your neighbors to your home and read with them from the precious Bible and from books that explain its truths. Invite, with, invite them to unite with you in song and prayer. In these little gatherings, Christ will himself be present, as he has promised, and hearts will be touched by his grace. So we're to start with those we know, start with those we live around. We're to think about ways that we can be interested in the temporal things, you know, things of this world, and also their spirituality. Learn how we can be a genuine friend and give genuine helpful words about Christ. And all of these things, my friend, take thought in the morning and in the evening. Prayer and thought. Is that all right? Can we all start doing that? Amen. Absolutely. So I pray that God would help us more and more to be able to grow in knowledge and understanding as we seek to win people's hearts to Him. And you know, like I said, these are things that I've just been starting to realize. I used to think that in order to preach a good sermon or give a good Bible study, you've got to talk fast and loud. You know, <laughs> as many Bible verses as you can give. You know, the more, the better, you know. Two hours, that's too short. Three hours, go, you know. So, but I've come to realize that, <laughs> I don't know, I guess my eyes were open. Like, okay, these people are tired and they want to go home. <laughs> so, um, actually, you know, God, God does not desire that. He wants us to think and to speak to the point. So I would like to give, um, you know, just a little testimony of how the Lord has been bringing these things into my life. Um, at least last week, um, on Tuesday night or Monday night, I was having morning, evening devotion. And as I was praying, the Lord impressed on my mind. Now I know it was the Lord. Keep your heart uplifted to prayer, up, uplifted in prayer to God tomorrow you know, as you work. And so 
And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. I really want to do that. Next morning, the same thought came back again. I was like, okay, this is interesting. I wonder what today holds. It started out as a normal day. Everything was all right. You know, nothing was different. But when we came to lunchtime, as I was praying, this old fellow who I was actually quite scared to speak to about Christ, you know, he was really educated and he probably had a very well-educated negative view about God. That was my judgment anyway. But it turns out this man is a defender of religion. And uh, as I was speaking, he was really, really listening. Later on that day, I found a Jewish man. Well, he's going through Bible studies to become a Jew. You know, <laughs> they actually do that as well. And uh, so it was just wonderful to be able to, you know, open up in the workplace and speak about these things. Um, but all the while, the Lord had been showing me, you're here in a secular workplace. Yes, you're working for a boss who gives you minimal pay. But remember, you're a missionary here. So do your best. And, um, you know, this is what Christ wants to develop in us. Well, let me finish with a verse. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 through to 10. It says, For by grace you are saved uh, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest that he mentioned boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, uh, which he hath um, which he hath prepared before him that we should walk in him. That's what it says. Um, so, you know, God wants us to receive his love, trust in his love, to document it in our minds and to give ourselves to him so that we can simply walk in the works that he has already prepared for us. So, my appeal to us this morning is to take time to think about what we read. Take time to think about what we listen to. And may God help us. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are a God of wisdom, a God of understanding, and a God of God of order. Lord, I just pray and ask that you would help us to be filled with your spirit and filled with the knowledge of you so that we can judge correctly on how we should approach this person or that person, Lord. Mm. I pray that you would go with us throughout the new week, that you would keep us close to you, uh, fill us with your spirit that we may reflect your goodness and your glory, your wonderful glory to those around us, Lord. Mm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.